No, good evening, and thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Um, this talk arise, uh, arose out of two pieces of work with which I've been involved over a number of years. Uh, one is part of the title, which is Metamaterials, which is a new sort of material that I'll tell you about in the course of the talk. Uh, but the other topic is, is a theoretical tool called transformation optics, which enables to use these metamaterials and do extraordinary things with them. So when we realized we had these very powerful tools for dealing with light and indeed electromagnetism generally, uh, we thought, how can we bring this to the attention of uh, the, the public at large? And uh, a bunch of equations or pictures of strange devices uh, don't have much impact. Uh, uh, but we realized we could do something quite extraordinary. We could make something invisible. And that was the sort of grand challenge which we set ourselves, uh, the idea being that if you can make something invisible, uh, you can do anything. <laughs> and it's, it's strange, but this, this thing of invisibility is, is something which, um, when, you, when I tell you how it's done, I'm sure you'll say, well, that's easy. I hope you will. <laughs> uh, but it's never less surprising, because light is so central to our lives it's, it's the chief medium through which we receive information uh, concerning the world about us. In fact, so central is it to our understanding of the world that in the English language when you say, I see, it means I understand. So uh, first to this idea of, this new idea of how to control light. The control of light, the study of light, it goes back thousands of years. Where I'm not going to go back thousands of years, but I will go back several centuries to these gentlemen. Uh, you will have learned this law at school, I'm sure, if you did physics, uh, which is Snell's law, uh, which tells how light changes direction when it is refracted into another material, such as glass or water. If you're French, it would be called Descartes' law, because he thought of it about the same time. And Newton also wrote it down without acknowledging either of them. <laughs> um, and, and it's great, uh, but it does have some limitations. It doesn't know anything about the wave nature of light. It assumes that light is uh, a particle. And it doesn't say anything about the possibility that light can also be reflected from this surface at the same time as it can be refracted. But it survived the centuries, and the reason for that is that it gives you a, an intuitive picture of what the light is doing. So if you wanted to move the light to here or to here, you can see in your mind's eye before you do the calculations that um, you need to tilt this or, or whatever. So it is a tool for thinking, for an inventing. And it's still with us. It's still used in the design of lenses because the picture it gives fires the imagination of how to control light. So what is light? It isn't a stream of particles, or, or maybe it is if you accept particle wave duality. The true nature of light was revealed by two gentlemen, um, Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell, both working in London at that time, Faraday at the Royal Institution and James Clark Maxwell at King's College, uh, which was before he moved to Cambridge and was the first Cavendish professor, as I'm sure you know. So what did Faraday do? Faraday discovered the law of electromagnetic induction. And he um, showed that if you uh, have a coil of copper wire and a galvanometer, if the magnet is stationary, nothing happens. But if you move the magnet, there's a deflection on the galvanometer. And he had a particular way of thinking about that. Faraday had very little formal education. He was a son of a blacksmith, came from a very, very poor family, 
And he always acknowledged that he knew no mathematics. But he had a very, very powerful imagination. And the way he thought of a magnetic field is illustrated by this, this sketch here, which shows uh, a magnet underneath a paper on which has been scattered some iron fi filings. And to Faraday's mind, that experiment, which many of you must have seen, revealed to him that the magnet was surrounded by something called a field. And that concept of a field was absolutely central to what Faraday discover, discovered because he showed that if you move the magnet, those lines of force, he imagined them cutting through the copper wire. And as they cut through the copper wire, that action of cutting forces the electrons at right angles to the direction of the field and to the direction of motion of the field. <coughs> Now, why was the field so essential in describing that effect? And it was this, that before that time, people thought about forces of action at a distance acting along the line separating the two objects. So if you had a gravitational field, then the force was inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two objects, be they planets or stars or what have you, and it acted along the line separating the two. But a field uh, introduces a new element. And when you think in terms of fields, what you say is that when you have uh, a gravitational object or when you have uh, an electrical charge, you have the same effect, the same law acting between them. And in the field picture, the charge is surrounded by a field, whether or not it's exerting a force on another charge. So the field acts as an intermediary and carries the force. And you might think that that is against the principles of philosophy, because in, in philosophy, you have something called Occam's razor, which says that when you have two explanations of a phenomenon, you adopt the simplest. And the simplest is action at a distance along the line separating the two. But it turns out that sometimes when you introduce something that's extraneous, that something enables you to do something new. And so it is with the field. Because you cannot describe an electromagnetic force in terms of uh, a force acting along the lines, the, the lines separating two objects. You need the concept of a field. And Faraday, who knew no mathematics, introduced to us the concept of the field. And the whole, virtually the whole of modern theoretical physics is cast in terms of field theory. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Faraday, who knew no mathematics. And this idea of field was taken up by the man down the road, James Clark Maxwell. And what Faraday has shown, had shown is that a changing magnetic field produces an electrical force. And Maxwell, who was a brilliant mathematician, uh, wrote that down here, never mind the funny symbols, what this says is if the magnetic field changes, you get an electric field. But, but Maxwell also realized that it was necessary to have another law which said that if an electrical field changes, then you get a magnetic field. And those were the two key ingredients of light because the changing magnetic field produces an electric field which changes, which produces a magnetic field, and so on and so forth. So light is a dance. It's a dance in which the electric field constantly changes into the magnetic field, into the electric field. The beat of the dance is the frequency, and the step of the dance is the wavelength. And <coughs> when Maxwell wrote down his equations, he showed them to Thomson, who later became Lord Kelvin, and Kelvin suggested that there was a wave-like solution to these, which Maxwell uh, was qu quick to find. And out of his equations came an expression for the velocity of 
these waves. And he compared that with the known velocity of light, and it was the same to experimental error. And that must have been the most amazing discovery, I think, of the 19th century, to find out what light is, which is so central to our lives. So we have some new takes on that, of how to control light and how to uh, set down equations which can give a visual picture of what these fields do. So instead of the rays which Snell used, we're going to follow in the footsteps of Faraday and Maxwell and take the electric and magnetic field lines as our picture of what light is, and we're going to manipulate these and show how to control them. So before I do that, uh, there's another chap who has something to say about light and who needs no introduction. And what Einstein showed in his theory of relativity was that um, light is affected by gravity. Now, that was very, very controversial because it's known that light doesn't have a mass. And Newton's law of gravity says that uh, the force, gravitational force, is proportional to the product of the mass of the two objects. So if you have the sun, uh, it's very massive. But if light is massless, the sun should not affect light. But Einstein had a different way of thinking about gravity. So he, too, rejected this action at a distance uh, theory of Newton. And he said that um, gravity acts in space. And before Einstein's time, the expressions for space consisted of different ways of saying nothing, empty, or what have you. But with Einstein, space came to be recognized as stuff, like any object, with, with properties which you can describe, just as you can describe the properties of glass or water or so on and so forth. So space had properties. And in particular, it has properties of geometry. And the geometry can be changed, and the geometry is changed by a, a, a strongly gravitational object like the sun, and space is bent. And now that's a different way of thinking about gravity. And if a photon, if light moves past the sun, then if space is bent, that's going to affect how the photon moves. And Einstein was able to show that um, the um, way that space is bent, which he described by something called the metric, which is just how much space is squashed or stretched or what have you, his, his metric sat in Maxwell's equations when he'd written them in his notation in the same place as the refractive index. So the sun is a giant lens. And so when starlight passes the sun, it moves not in a straight line. It actually moves on a trajectory. And that was one of the crucial tests of uh, general relativity. And actually, it was a test made by a man who lived just down the road, Arthur Stanley Eddington, who was Plumian Professor of Astronomy at the time in Cambridge. And Eddington made two observations. Well, he made one observation, but his partner made another observation. Uh, one of them was uh, foiled by cloud, but the other yielded a result which showed that uh, you can only see this deflection of starlight when the sun is eclipsed, because otherwise the glare from the sun is too great to actually see the star. But during an eclipse, you can observe the star, which appears to be in the wrong position in the sky because the trajectory of the light is bent. So we're going to deal with bent space. And the way we're going to control light or electromagnetic fields generally is to think about the field lines and to think about them being embedded in space and recognize that we can actually change the properties of space. So if we bend space, stretch the rubber of space, then the field line will behave as though it's glued to the space, embedded in this space. And as you stretch space, you move the, the constituents of light, which are the electric and magnetic fields. 
And so with this stretching of space, um, you can push and shove the light to wherever you want it to be. Now, I'm not suggesting that you really push and shove space, but what we're going to do is to use the trick that says that distorting space, as far as light is concerned, is like changing the refractive index of the material through which it's, it's moving. And that's a bit easier than bending space itself. And so this distortion of space I recorded here by drawing some Cartesian coordinates and so that you can tell how much space has been distorted when you uh, uh, do your stretching and bending. And so you can think of the stretching as a coordinate transformation, and hence the name transformation optics. And there's a very simple rule, not that simple, uh, which, which says that if, if you want to know how transforming space changes things, then if you squash space this way, then perpendicular to the direction of squashing, the electrical and magnetic responses are increased by the inverse of the squashing factor, and along the direction of squashing, they decreased by the same factor. And you can crawl over this little figure here and measure how much space is squashed in this direction, this direction, and this direction, and apply that law, and how much it's tilted as well. And so you can find, uh, just with a ruler and a protractor, the uh, electrical response of this system, and hence the refractive index, needed to send the light in this direction. So it, it's really, uh, at the heart of it, very simple. And there's this intuitive picture, except that you, you, you have to throw rays away, but in return you get something which looks very like a ray, which is a field line. And that's, that's transformation optics. So we've got these tools, but they demand some rather unusual materials if you're going to enact the recipes which they give for controlling light in a particular way. And that's where these things called metamaterials come in. Uh, meta, I gather from my Greek friends, means beyond. Um, and the way they work is that if you imagine, or if you know that uh, an ordinary material such as glass responds to electric and magnetic fields by polarizing the atoms, which are the constituents of the material, then a metamaterial says, well, as well as atoms, you can have man-made structures in there, such as little nanoparticles. And they don't even have to be nanoparticles if the wavelength is very, very long. Of course, uh, they just have to be small on the wavelength. And so by structuring something, you can change the electric and magnetic properties very, very drastically without changing its chemical composition. So to the variable of chemistry, you now add the variable of structure. And structure is not limited by the periodic table. So you have a very, very great variety of properties you can uh, create. I'll give you an example of that. So you're familiar with the fact that if you take silver and polish it very well, it's an extremely good mirror. But you may also be familiar with silver in another form. So in an old-fashioned photographic negative, the black is silver. But what's different from the mirror is that the silver is now ground up into very, very fine nanoparticles. And that change of the structure completely alters, sil alters silver from being highly reflecting to being one of the best absorbers that we know. So that's an example of how structure can drastically alter the properties of the material. So here's one of the first uh, uh, structures that we <coughs> created. This work was done as part of a consultancy with the Marconi Co Company of Fond Memory. <laughs> And the idea was to make magnetism without magnets. So here you have some copper rings. And uh, if you put a, a magnetic field normal to this plane, a changing magnetic field, Faraday will tell you that a current will flow in those rings. And we also know that a current flowing round in a ring itself creates a magnetic field. So you can get a magnetic response for the, from this substance entirely made of non-magnetic -ma materials. 
Um, and in fact, there's another little trick we introduced, which was to make a cut in these rings. So actually, you make a resonator there. And that proved very useful in some of the other applications we, we made. Um, and this structure really caught on. Uh, one of the reasons was that it does very interesting things. But the other very important reason is that it's very, very easy to make. This rides on the back of the printed circuit industry. So the dimensions here are about uh, five millimeters. And this is designed to work not with light, but with other electromagnetic radiation radar waves. Um, and the fact that you could take a ride on another technology meant that all you had to do was to design this structure on your computer, post off the file to some manufacturer, and back through the post would come your metamaterial. Uh, so if ever you want to have some new technology, it's very useful to catch a ride on something else. So if you do anything new in electronics, it had better be in silicon, otherwise you're in deep trouble. As uh, it's been recognized many times. Now this idea uh, of magnetism without magnets and, and so on and so forth was, was taken up in UCSD by, by David Smith, who's since become a very good friend and a collaborator. And <clears throat> this, this was actually the first um, dramatic application of um, metamaterials. Now, these little rings, I should explain, have a rather unusual property. So instead of just producing a, a magnetic response, they, they have a very special magnetic response. So this ring has inductance because it goes around in a circle. And it also has capacitance because there's a gap between the ends here. Capacitor inductor makes something called a resonator. So the current swings back and forth in this ring, the energy being tossed between electricity and magnetism. And resonators do some very, very strange things. So if you alter the frequency with which you uh, attack this ring and tune it through that resonant frequency, the magnetic response does something remarkable. It changes sign. So you get a normal polarization of the ring in the direction of the field. Uh, one side of the resonance and the other side of the resonance, it changes. And you can see that with uh, a child's swing. So um, if, if, if you have a young kid in the swing and you push the swing, it goes where you push it. And if you let go, it swings with a natural frequency. But the child's bad brother comes and starts to shake the spring, the swing, you'll find that the swing will do that. So the swing will go in the opposite direction. Have you tried it? Try it without the child. It's a much better. <laughs> so that's what a resonator does, that if you tune through the resonant frequency, its response is opposite. So this, this material actually has a negative magnetic response at a certain frequency. It, it polarizes in the opposite direction the applied magnetic field. And that is something which people have been seeking for a long time. And there's no material in nature that will do that at the right frequency. And uh, also in this structure is a wire here, which is also a resonator. And that does the same thing for electricity. So this structure has a consequence that it has a negative electrical response and a negative magnetic response. And there was a guy called Vesalago many years ago who said that if you did that, if those two things are negative, then you'd have a material with a negative refractive index. And that caused a bit of a furor at the time um, because, um, so here's a positive refractive index. That's what light does in water and glass and almost everything. And this is what light would do if the refractive index is negative. So the light goes to the other side of the normal. And instead of a positive angle, you get a negative angle. And that has all sorts of consequences. And if I have time, I hope to tell you something about them. And I'm done telling you about invisibility. Just one more slide on metamaterials. So the first metamaterial was made to work with radar waves, but people have been making them to work with optical devices. And this is a metamaterial from the Jang Group in Berkeley, California. And it consists of very thin layers 
30 nanometers of silver, 50 nanometers of uh, an insulator, a dielectric, stacked together and with a series of holes cut in them. And that structure create, also creates a negative refractive index, but this time at optical frequencies. So they've been very uh, successful in uh, uh, tackling all sorts of challenges. But I've been nattering for half an hour, and it's about time I got onto invisibility, I hear you cry. So what is the challenge of invisibility? Uh, the challenge is not hiding, not so much hiding something, because here you see Peter Pan. Um, and if you painted Peter's statue black, you could still know that he was there, because you see the shadow. And the secret is, like Peter Pan, you must lose the shadow. So how do we lose the shadow? That's the trick. Now, I said that space is made of rubber. So what we want to do is to uh, start with empty space. And here's a field line going through. and. That's part of the light. So we want to clear all the field lines out of this region here so that light never gets in here. And so we can hide something there, make it invisible. But don't forget the shadow. Not only have we got to expel the field lines from this region here, but we mustn't disturb them what they're doing in what they're doing out here, because otherwise there would be a shadow and you would know that something was there. So you can push the field li lines about here, but not here. And the way we do that is to poke our fingers into space and make a hole, and then we stretch space and we compress it into a cloak. But that cloak is finite, so within the cloak you can do what you want, and what we want to do is to make this hole in space push all the field lines into the cloak, out of the hidden region, so light never sees what's inside. But we mustn't distort space outside the cloak. And if we don't distort space outside the cloak, the field lines are not affected. And that's how we make a cloak. We make the light flow like water. Light doesn't naturally flow like water, but if you make it flow like water, it'll behave the cloak will behave like a, a rock in a stream. So the water flows around a lot, the rock smoothly, and then afterwards closes up. And when you're downstream, you don't see any disturbance from the rock. And that's what we want to do with light. So if you want to get mathematical, you can make a transformation and say, here is the region we're going to build our cloak in. We're going to create our hidden space by doing a radio compression. Here's the formula. And uh, push all of space, taking with it all the field lines of the light, into this region here. And then, knowing this coordinate transformation, or, or just the trick I showed you of squashing things, you can say what the refractive index in this region must be in order that the light behaves like that. And when you're done, light truly flows like water. And I remember I went to Malva and consulting on it there, and uh, we'd just written this paper on cloaking, and uh, they didn't believe it, so they got their big computers out, and they said, where's your formula? Where does it work? And uh, long silence as they waited for the results, and yeah, they did that. So, good. Um, but that's a bit different from uh, uh, refracting it in interface, because what you need to do is not a sudden jog of the light changing direction at an interface. You've got to smoothly vary the refractive index. And that's something which ordinary materials don't do. They have sudden transitions. There are instances in nature where it does happen, and that's the mirage. So uh, for example, if you have a layer of hot air, which is less refracting than the cool air above it, and way in the distance, you can see light, which has been bent originally from its original trajectory of heading towards the ground. 
never touches the ground. It enters your eye, and you see in the distance what looks like water reflecting. Uh, we don't have deserts in the UK. Uh, we just have droughts. Um, but here's, here's a road mirage, which happens on tarmac on a very hot day, summer's day. And you can see this sort of liquid. And that, that's just, just the mirage. And, and it's just this effect of refracted light. So you can bend light continuously. Here's the first shot at doing it, which is done by David Smith again. Um, and they took these metamaterials because ordinary materials won't do. They don't have a continuously variable refractive index normally. And this is the gradient of the refractive index, according to the formula, from the outside to the inside of this cloak. And uh, you can see that it's a finite dimension, so this is for radar waves. And this is the hidden region inside here. Now, since that time, uh, I won't show you the slides. They're very old now for the first cloak. Since that time, people have said, well, can't we go beyond radar waves? Can we hide something that you can actually see? And so we, we turned our minds to doing that. And that's actually quite difficult to do because uh, at optical frequencies, mat material, you've got to build a cloak out of some material. And you're running out of responses and materials that you may want. So building the cloak is a challenge. You can design it, but building it is, is something else. And so we, we, we try to make life easy for the experimentalists. And what we're thinking about a cloak is that it's a special sort of lens. Now, most lenses make things bigger. But there are lenses that make things smaller. And if you can build a lens that makes something infinitely small, you can't see it. That's what a cloak is. It makes the thing infinitely small. Now, a bit of geometry. There are actually three ways you can make things infinitely small. You can take uh, the, the object and you can, through an optical illusion, crush it into a point. And whatever the properties of the point, electrical and magnetic, is small enough you can't see it. Another way, you can take the object and you can squash it into a very, very thin wire. And if it's thin enough, you don't see it. And the third thing you might do is to squash the thing into a very, very flat sheet. Now, it turns out that when you do that, you increase the response in the sheet. And the sheet is a very good mirror. And of course, you can only it's only invisible if you look at it edge way on. So you might think that that's not much use. But there is a place you can hide a mirror. Maybe some of you heard me give this talk before. I always ask this question, where would you hide a mirror? What if you had another mirror? You have an infinitely flat mirror, and if you put it on top of another mirror, it's just one mirror. You don't know that there are two mirrors there. And it turns out that um, in radar technology, uh, and in, in, in many optical instances, the, you, you, you have what's called a, a ground plane. The ground can be very reflective to some radar waves. So if you can make an object apparently flat with the ground, it just looks like a piece of ground. Now, the reason I go through these three stages is that you change the dimensions one by one. It actually becomes easier to make the cloak. And the flattened cloak, or carpet cloak, as we call it, is the easiest to make. And that has, in fact, been uh, manufactured um, to make things invisible. So here's the design. You start off with um, a piece of ordinary flat space, and then you push and compress these cells upwards, changing their refractive index as you go to create this little hidden tunnel here. And viewed from outside, if you make this right, then it will appear that this is a flat surface. And here's a computer simulation. By the way, I should say that uh, my postdoc, Jensen Lee, did all this work, and it's really his cloak. So if, if you took this um, surface with a, a hiding place here, you, you know that somebody was hiding there because this reflecting surface would uh, send off not just a single reflection, as a mirror would, but you'd have reflections from the facets of this cloak here. So if I scan my laser beam I, it, as I went over the hidden, so-called hidden region, it would go twinkle, twinkle, 
and you know it was there. But if you put the cloak in place, a single beam comes in, a single beam goes out. So that's how it should work. And it turns out that this particular cloak you can make out of natural materials. Very, very unusual. But uh, Zhuang Zhang's group in Birmingham actually made this cloak out of calcite. So here's the hidden region. And it turns out that if you do this compression right, these can be made out of calcite crystals, which are naturally anisotropic materials. They're birefringent. <coughs> and he has, Zhuang has many contacts in China. And China is a great resource for huge samples of materials these days. And he got these rather <coughs> large crystals of calcite. So viewed from outside, this should appear as though there's a flat burrow here. And he had a rather clever way of demonstrating that. So he uh, viewed this alphabet through the mirror. Now, when the mirror has a kink in it, because of the hiding place, and you don't have a cloak, you only see part of the alphabet. So A, B, C, D, and then the, the middle bit is refracted out of the way by this, this chunk here, and then you only see the second half of the alphabet. But if you put the cloak in place, then you see the whole alphabet. And this, this is in glorious technicolor. And the reason for that is that there's been some beefing about whether these cloaks are broadband, whether they just work for a single color or whether they work for all colors. Well, of course, they don't work for x-rays and they don't work for uh, um, radar waves in this instance, but they do work for the almost entire visible spectrum. And you just see a bit of chromatic aberration there for this particular cloak. So you can make a cloak for, for visible light. Um, <coughs> now, um, yes, I think I have time to tell you about the magnetism as well. So Snell's law, which is where we started, is the intuitive way of how to control light. And it's dependent on what's called the ray approximation. <coughs> but if our theory is so clever, as we <laughs> claim it is, then our theory should work for any sort of electricity or magnetism or electromagnetism. And so the ultimate test is whether you can cloak, uh, not an electromagnetic wave, but whether you can cloak from a static magnetic field. And no problem. The theory says, yes, we should be able to do that. And in fact, it's easier because if you have light, you have electricity and magnetism, and you've got to control both. But if you just have a magnetic field, it's only the magnetic response of the cloak that you want. So this is the picture I drew, drew you for um, rays, if you like. And here are the magnetic field lines. And we can do exactly the same for them using the same formula for different materials. And we published that way, way back. I think I, yeah. So we, we suggested this in 2007. And it sat there as a piece of theory in the literature for a long time. And then uh, about uh, five or six years ago, this paper appeared. They didn't tell me they were doing the experiment, but they did. And they made the cloak out of uh, superconducting material. Um, lead becomes superconducting at a low temperature. And you can see that they made a metamaterial by scoring the lead and breaking it up into these little plates. So it has the properties which we said it should. And so um, what they did was to make a, a cylinder, a cloak in the form of a cylinder. And this cylinder was put between two electromagnets, which if um, there was no cylinder there, would produce this uniform magnetic field. And then they did some experiments. And what they hoped would happen is that the cloak will capture the magnetic field lines, guide it around this object here so there are no magnetic field inside the cloak. And outside the cloak, the field lines should be undisturbed. And they put lots of sensors here, but I'll only show you the results for two of them. So in uh, position one, 
there's a, there's a sensor, and if there's no cloak, then as you ramp up the field in the electromagnetics, so the magnetic field increases. But if you put the cloak in place, nothing happens. But what about the shadow? And that's measured on sensor two, which should show that nothing happens there whether or not you have the cloak. So if you have no cloak or you have a cloak in place, this field is exactly the same. So you're hiding something, but anybody outside looking at that field doesn't know that because the field is completely undisturbed. So that's proof that our cloak works for all sorts of fields, or at least many sorts of fields. Now I want to turn to this question of uh, negative refraction. Um, so I, sh I showed you this, this slide before, and Vesalago in 1968 asked the question, what, how can we make something which has negative refraction, sends a light this way instead of that way when it enters the material, and what other properties follow from negative refraction. And he came up with a whole host of things, some of which I'll show you. Um, but it was all theory. And there were no materials in nature which would fulfill his requirements. <laughs> his requirements were that the material should have a negative magnetic and a negative electrical response. And then it would do this. And there'd be the third negative of the refractive index. And so the idea died to death until uh, the Smith group um, actually made this uh, negative material and showed that it had these negative refracting properties. And uh, the whole thing sprang to, to life at that point. Now, you, you may say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, positive, negative, we even have imaginary numbers. Well, why get excited about a, a sign? Um, well some strange things happen. So let's uh, take a source of light inside this material and do a ray tracing, and the light will be focused again here. So if you had a fish tank and filled not with water but with a negative refracting material, you would see the fish above the surface of the water, like this. Um, and there are many other very, very strange things which uh, follow because you have a, a, a negative refractive index. Uh, in fact, if you go back to this idea that um, Einstein had that um, the geometry of space is equivalent to a refractive index. So as far as light is concerned, you can mimic a distortion of space with a change in the refractive index. Well, let me show you something perhaps a little un unusual. Now, I did explain to you that when you squash space, you, you increase the refractive uh, index of this material. You increase the electrical magnetic response in this direction. <clears throat> and so I'm going to make some uh, negative refractive material uh, and I'm going to do it by squashing space. I'm going to squash some space, okay? And as I squash more, the refractive index increases. And then I'm a theorist, so I can squash infinitely hard. And the refractive index shoots up to plus infinity. And then I go beyond that point because I'm a theorist. And... You know what happens with a function 1 upon x. It goes to infinity on the plus side of x and minus infinity on the other side. And that's exactly what happens here. So now this material in the middle has a, a negative um, metric. And that's, you've made something which is negative refracting. But you've done something very, very strange. So this is ordinary space. You go from here to here to here. But this is peculiar space, isn't it? It has what we call three manifolds. So at the same point, there's another piece of space underneath it, and a third one. 
under that. So what, is, what the light thinks it's doing, you think the light is doing that. Well, what the light thinks it's doing, because it sees this negative refractive index and thinks it's in a space which has been made negative, the light thinks it's doing that. And so this point is passed three times by the light. And so if you have a focus here, you get a second focus here, and a third focus as it comes out the other side. Now, an ordinary lens you design using ray optics, and it has limitations. It can only focus light to a point, not a point, to a disk, which is no smaller than something like half the wavelength of light. That's a very, very fundamental limitation to all optical instruments. And beating that limit is, is something which is uh, very, very central to all sorts of uh, disciplines, particularly to biology, because the inside of a cell starts to show interesting things just below that limit. And two years ago, uh, uh, three scientists were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize for a very interesting technology for actually uh, breaking that limit in a fascinating way. But this particular lens does break that limit because this argument is, is based on uh, transformation optics via the courtesy of Maxwell's equ equations. So if, if this point, if this theory really is true and exact, whatever is here is exactly the same here and exactly the same there. And in 2000, I published a paper uh, called The Perfect Lens, which caused a perfect storm, I might say. Uh, and it's been verified now that if you can perfectly make uh, a piece of material which has this property, then you will perfectly reproduce the electromagnetic fields here, here, and here, without any limit to their uh, focusing power. And you can understand it very simply in those terms. But once you've seen that it's a remarkable thing, you think, well, what the hell's the point of a, a lens that produces uh, an image which is exactly the same size of the object? It's exact, yeah, but it's the same size. Mm. So uh, what we can do is to do transformation optics over again and take this slab of material and bend it round into, and make a, either a sphere or a cylinder, whichever, and there's the formula you can use. And now you can make a perfect magnifying glass. So here's some negative refractive material. Here are the formulae for the uh, electric and magnetic responses. And if you do that, then everything which is inside this green circle here, the red stuff, viewed from outside, appears as though it's within this red circle here. So it's a magnifying glass. And think about it, that's a bit strange. Now, I, I usually get a plastic bottle, so I can't do this, but <coughs> here I have the genuine article of a glass bottle of water. You probably can't see it at the back, but if, if you took an old-fashioned milk bottle, it would be even more obvious. It's a little strange. The water seems to go right to the edge of the glass. Yes, you can't see the glass, right? You can't see the thickness of the glass. And that remains true even for quite thick glass up to something the ratio of the refractive index. Um, and it's easily explained by ray optics. But this bottle is different. So if this bottle were made of a negative refracting material and it were full of milk, the milk would appear to be out here. <laughs> How come? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me show you. So here in a ray tracing figure, uh, is, is the dilemma which, which this uh, piece of theory presents you with. So I'm going to do some ray tracing. So remember, there's nothing inside this red circle until you meet the blue circle. 
And so the ray comes in, and it hits the blue circle, and negatively refracted, negatively refracted again, comes out, and so on and so forth. So anything in here is, is magnified by this, this sort of process here. Um, and that's true right up to this point here. Um, so this is the last ray to hit, physically hit, the lens. And that goes in here. But the theory says that everything inside here should come out here, or everything that hits this red circle should go in here. But this ray doesn't touch the lens. So how can it get in? Well, here's a simulation based not on ray tracing, but on Maxwell's equations. And it does get in. Now, this didn't work too well when I tried it earlier, so blame the technology. Let me, OK. OK, well, that's good enough, I guess. So here, here's an electromagnetic wave coming in from the left. Uh, this is a Maxwell simulator. And you can see that, uh, indeed, the contents of the red circle are compressed into compressed waves going more slowly in this inner circle here. So it is true that, um, now I need to get back to my talk. Yes, I think that works, um, except that I've gone one on. So to continue this, this explanation of the paradox, so this is the last ray to hit something physical, and it doesn't <coughs> fill. And these rays here, which are supposed to be put in, and are put in, because Maxwell beats rays any day, um, they don't get in, uh, according to the ray. And then the explanation is that the ray is just a construction, and you can't make an infinitely thin ray the best you can do is what's called a Gaussian beam, which actually is, is very tightly focused, but has tails on it. And those tails interact with something else, because let's ask what happens to these rays in here, which are supposed to get out and go up there. But according to the ray approximation, they don't. They go re negatively refract, and they go round in these funny little squashed circles here. And they're what we call resonances. And they sit there forever. But they don't, because all rays have tails on them. And these tails tickle the resonances. And so when you first switch on, you only feel half. Thing. But gradually, the energy leaks into these modes here. It's a bit like the, uh, you know, the classic experiment of uh, uh, the sound of uh, a powerful singer's voice can break a wine glass. It's usually a lady singer because the frequency of the glass vibration is tunes with that voice. And if she sings loud enough and long enough and the, the crystal is pure enough, the resonance will gather the energy and eventually burst. Uh, you can break a glass. I've never seen it done. I've searched on YouTube, uh, but uh, somebody may have seen the experiment done. But it's supposed to be a classic experiment. That's exactly what's going on here that these rays have little tails on them, and they tickle the resonance here. And over time, this resonance builds and fills the top half of this circle here. So you can do crazy things with it. So um, what, uh, what if you want to make uh, uh, a very big shadow with a very small object? You might think you can't have a shadow bigger than the object itself, which you can, because this lens says that anything inside this uh, lens will appear to be much bigger. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this lens, and inside it, I'm going to put some black stuff. And then the whole of this region here will appear black. And again, here's a simulation, so we've done um, this is done by my student Wei Shung Wei, who's now in Singapore. And he did this simulation of having a wave come in here and some black stuff here and a magnifying lens, and nothing should enter 
this circle here without being absorbed, and you get this whacking great shadow, which is much bigger than the original black object and much bigger than the lens which is producing the really big shadow. So with transformation optics, we enter a land of paradoxes which um, cannot be understood if you just take the ray approximation. And it's not only a land of uh, things which entertain theorists and some experimentalists, but it is an idea, a set of ideas, which are being taken up and now being commercialized. So I want to spend the last second or two, minute or two, telling you about some of the commercialization that's taking place of metamaterials and transformation optics. So there's an outfit called Intellectual Ventures in Seattle, and they're developing a technology based on metamaterials which enables you to build uh, very efficient satellite communication dishes. So <clears throat> if, if you're a reporter out in some place where there's no cell phone or no landlines, you use a satellite communication dish. It's about so big, 30 centimeters. It's heavy, takes quite a bit of power, and it's expensive. It's about ten, twenty thousand dollars 20000 But you can... Using metamaterials, you can have the same effect with a, a flat piece of material, which is about 30 centimeters in diameter. But by making the metamaterial tunable, you can have that flat plate point at different parts of the heavens without it physically moving by altering the properties of the metamaterial. And so you can make a SATCOM receiver. Now, I've explained to you that these metamaterials can be made just out of printed circuit boards, so they're very, very cheap. And the target price for uh, marketing these um, when they come into mass production is, is about $1,000 to $2,000. So um, the company is called Chimeta, if you want to Google it and have a look what they're doing now. It's partly funded by Bill Gates. I think it's got a $200 million capitalization at the moment. And uh, he's interested because, of course, it's very useful to his Africa products. But it's spreading out beyond that area to all sorts of things, um, collision avoidance and so on. Um, and here's a picture of the device. Um, Toyota are very interested. And a couple of years ago, um, a Toyota uh, crossed America with one of these devices in its roof. Uh, so uh, Toyota are in constant communication with that car. And the idea is that eventually, they will have one of these SATCOM devices in the roof of every Toyota so they can talk to the car in real time, monitor it, and find out what it's doing. You may or not like that, but that's what they want to do. Um, Airport security, it's a pain to go through all this scanning. You know, you do this, and that's, that's slow and expensive. But what if you had a clever system that, as you walk through, could just do the scanning uh, of you as, as you walked on your way to the check-in? That's possible. People are developing that using metamaterials. Here's another one. Um, Federico Capasso invented something called the quantum cascade laser. And that is a laser which generates this, this very exciting region of the spectrum called terahertz, which is used for things like collision avoidance radar, all sorts of other things. <clears throat> now, the problem with terahertz uh, lasers is that although it's very clever and does the job, there, there, there is a, a problem of a communication because you have the energy provided by an electron, which is jumping down little cascades of steps, and that is on a scale of nanometers. And you're wanting to couple this radiation to, to, to this radiation, which has a length scale of millimeters. And that length scale means that the coupling isn't very good. And so you can enormously increase the efficiency of these lasers by uh, building around it a metamaterial structure which uh, concentrates the radiation and harvests it much more efficiently th than it would just, just having this thing in free space. Uh, what else? Ah, yes, here's a lens. 
you could make, uh, this is uh, something which was built for the Boeing Co Corporation. This is about 30 centimeters in diameter. It's used for focusing radar waves, and it's a perfectly flat lens, and instead of changing the refracting power by altering the thickness of the lens, you change the refracting power by altering the nature of the materials as you go from the edge to the center. You just make the more refractive um, graded index lenses. Um, oh, yes, and this is work by a colleague of mine, Richard Sims. So he's interested in magnetic resonance imaging. And if you want to take a magnetic resonance imaging in high resolution of the heart, uh, some problem in the heart maybe, if you want to see what's going on, you, you have to get a coil near the heart. And the way that's done at the moment is you make a cut in a vein of the leg. <clears throat> you shove a wire with a coil on the end of it up the vein until it reaches the heart, and then you do the scanning. Um, that works. <coughs> you have to be very, very careful, though, because you have about a meter of electrical wire surrounded by RF fields, which are quite powerful, of about the same wavelength inside the body. And it can get hot if you're not careful. And a hot wire inside a vein is not clever technology. So instead, Richard said, why do we take this exquisite magnetic resonance signal and turn it into an electrical signal? It's a very dangerous thing to do because the body is very quiet as regards magnetism. So you can actually hear this magnetic signal. It's a very, very noisy environment for electricity. So if you put a detector of the right frequency near your body, it will go shh, like that, full of noise, electrical noise. Far better to keep the magnetic signal as magnetism, but you need a wire for magnetism. And that's what Richard has designed. So he has this, uh, I don't suppose you can see the details here, but believe me, what this does is to take a magnetic signal from one end and transport it as magnetism to the other end, um, keeping it safe from the heating effects, but also preserving this exquisite quietness which um, the magnetic field has. I don't know where Richard's got with the commercialization of that, but I know he was, when I last spoke to him, intending to form a company. So, um, for me, this whole subject of metamaterials, uh, transformation optics, it's been <clears throat> a wonderful time because it's satisfied several of my requirements of science. One is that it be exciting, do something novel, surprise you. You, you, know, you think of ideas yourself, and then the theory bounces back and says to you, have you thought of this? Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> And that's the case with things like negative refraction and cloaking. They reveal things to science that you, you hadn't thought of yourself until you actually worked through the mathematics and saw what it did. But in addition, this isn't merely playing with things, amusing yourself. At the end of the day, you, you should, in my estimation, be able to somehow repay your debt to society who provided the money for all this. And this subject is, is in the business of doing that in spades. There were 30,000 references in the literature to metamaterials last year. And uh, that, that's continuing because of the excitement of, that it provides not only to recruiting young people to the subject of uh, metamaterials, but also to the commercialization. And so it, it's been a very exciting time for us in London. And I, I hope tonight I've conveyed some of that excitement to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir John, for that uh, uh, astonishing lecture. I, I'm, um, I'm minded to think that a wise man knows what he doesn't know, and I've just discovered a whole lot more that I didn't know, so I must be wiser. Um, questions, please, from the audience. Uh, and I'd ask you to wait until a microphone arrives uh, so that you can, um, you can be heard by everybody. Thank you. What's the largest and smallest wavelength you can make it visible? 
Sorry? What's the largest and smallest wavelength you can make invisible? Uh, the largest wavelength? Yeah. Um, well, how much money have you got? <laughs> uh, there is no problem about long wavelengths other than the physical size. Of course, you have to have a cloak to control a long wavelength, which is a com at least a comparable di dimension to the wavelength. Um, so, uh, yes, it, it, can, it can be a problem to control very, very long waves, uh, except if they're infinitely long, which is a st static magnetic field. And then I've, I've shown you a cloak which has been designed to do that, but that's a special case. In general, the cloak has to be quite big, and the longer the wavelength, the bigger it is. So it's money. What's the smallest? What's the smallest? And the smallest wavelength? Well, that's limited by the properties of materials. So the electric and magnetic responses of materials are determined by how the electrons move. The electrons are massive, not very massive, and their mass says that you can only shake them so fast. And if you get up to optical frequencies, you're beginning to run out of extreme responses that you may make, need to make a metal material. If you go to very, very high frequencies like X-rays, the electrons hardly move when an electron, when an X-ray goes through them, and that's why your body's transparent to X-rays because the electrons just don't move; they, it's too fast. So you you couldn't build a cloak for X-rays. You have nothing to make it from. Design one, but couldn't make it. Uh, when you first uh, touched on negative refractive index, you had a slide which showed the normal Snell case and then your negative refractive index. The, as we looked at it, in the negative refractive index case, the beam came in from our left, but then also was shown as moving towards our left. Why not exactly the same case, just a bigger R, but going in the same direction, which would then naturally lead to essentially total external reflection. Why did the beam come back on the same side as it is? Because that doesn't normally, whatever the refractive index, that surely <laughs> won't happen. Yes, um, that, that question caused a, one of the big controversies about negative refraction because, um, okay, if I may get a little bit technical here, if you have a flat surface when light crosses the surface, uh, there's a quantity which is conserved because of the flatness of the surface, and that's the momentum parallel to the surface. So if the light is coming in at an angle this way, it may change the angle a, a bit, but it's traveling slower here. So you basically have the same momentum on either side. It's traveling in the same direction. But if you have negative refractive index, then the momentum appears to violate this law because it appears to be traveling in the opposite direction. And the explanation of that is that what you see with your eye is not the momentum. It's actually something called the group velocity. And the group velocity doesn't dictate what the momentum is. And the group velocity can be opposite to the wave velocity, which determines the momentum. And so if you had a little pulse of light going through, you'd see the pulse moving. And then if you looked inside the pulse, the waves would be trying to get out the other side. And that's another of these very curious things. There are some examples of some water waves have that peculiar property of negative refraction, of the, the packet going that way and the waves inside. And that's the explanation of what happens at the surface. Very, very weird. Um, so how far away do you think we are from getting like a say, popular image of an invisibility cloak? Like how far away are we from making Peter Pan disappear? <laughs> well, um, okay, that's what everybody wants to know. Uh, I say, it, when asked this question, my response is usually it's not Harry Potter's cloak, it's Harry Potter's shed, because I've already explained that the cloak has to have a finite thickness, and, and the thicker it is, the better it is. Um, again, it's a question of expense. Uh, you, you could make a static 
cloak, which didn't wave around. Um, one has been made of dimensions of centimeters. If, if you got uh, access to enough materials, and these materials are quite expensive, you could build one conceivably which, which held a human being and that they would be invisible. Um, but as to making something which is really thin like a material, I, I don't see a way of doing that. My, some of my colleagues disagree, and they have th thought of ways that they might do it. But uh, a, a true cloak of invisibility that from all directions, no, sir. <laughs> the cloak was, uh, as I explained at the beginning, it was a device for, it was a grand challenge, which um, uh, the, commercial, the commercialization which comes out of it is, is not going to be cloaks. So they're, they're, you know, they're extraordinary things, but um, they're not to be commercialized. It was a grand challenge that if we can do this, we can do anything. And there were people who wrote in the literature that it was impossible to make a cloak that made something truly invisible, but we show that that's not true. And you can, and we have. We're getting into asking all the obvious, naive questions, so I'll, I'll contribute please, one. Please, please. <laughs> um, the, uh, the cloaking device that's featured in Star Trek um, uh, works by manipulating electric and magnetic fields. Um, why, why is that not a practical way forward? Why, why do we have to look at metamaterials? Um, I think metamaterials are a way of manipulating electromagnetic fields, yes. So if you're going to manip manipulate a field, what, how are you going to do it? What is going to act upon that field? And that has to be a material of some sort. Yes? Um, I'm talking about... Sorry. Uh, I'm talking about creating, a, creating like a, ver a very strong magnetic, magnetic field, for instance. Would, does, does that not... Uh, distort rays ah, of light that pass so, through. So it? you're trying to manipulate fields with fields. With fields, yes. Well, uh, you know, that is in principle possible, but I, I'll give you a demonstration. This laser point travels in a straight line, despite the fact that there are millions, billions of photons crossing its path. And what that tells you is that one photon ignores another photon. And so it's very difficult to influence a photon with another photon. And the only way we know of doing it so far is, is to pass the two photons through a material. And then you can make one photon switch another or send it in a different direction. But it, it's a difficult trick. So, yeah, OK, <laughs> Star Wars, they can do anything they want. <laughs> but not, not for real. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much for your talk. I had a question about the space folding. Um, this thing? Uh, yeah, that one. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, uh, um, so it seems we start with one point in space, and then your demonstration appeared to say that we folded some other space on top of that space, so that we ended up with three different points. And I wanted to know more about the relationship between the three points we ended up with and the first point we started with. Yes, good, good, good. <laughs> That's a tough one, but I think over the years I've figured out how to answer it. There is a dilemma here because it's a bit like time travel, isn't it? That there are all the paradoxes to do with time travel. What if you went back in time and met yourself? This is uh, like space-time travel, that you, if, if, if you um, were standing here, and then you'd see yourself there and there and there. Um, and th the way around that paradox in this instance is that um, this, this uh, lens only works for light of a very, very specific frequency. And what that means is that it must never change in time. All right, so once you've established the focus, it's there forever. So you can't sort of go around and look at it because it's frozen. 
uh, and, and that's what having a very narrow frequency means, that, that you, all you see is that one frequency, and it doesn't change with time. Uh, and that's the way you, you, you resolve the paradox of the time paradox, that you, you can't go back in time. And uh, if you could really do this at all frequencies, you, you, you violate some laws of logic, which I think is probably what's troubling you right now. But the single frequency sort of sidesteps that. So I think it's OK. By the way, this is something even black holes can't do. They, they can't, I don't think they can make uh, a, a negative metric. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so my question is, given that over time we'll be seeing advancements in invisibility cloaks and sheds, what do you think is going to be the most interesting application of this development? It'll be one I have not thought of. <laughs> Uh, so the, the traditional trajectory of uh, new ideas, I, I think, is beautifully illustrated by the laser, which was you know, one of the most wonderful inventions uh, based on some very esoteric theory. And then it was realized first in the maser and then the laser. It took 30 or 40 years before people were doing really astonishing things with the laser. The first big commercial application of the laser was supermarket checkouts. Big deal, you know, how to get excited about a supermarket. Well, some people do, but not for the right reasons. Um, and and this, is, this is typical because when you have a new idea, the first applications tend to be making something you do already slightly better or cheaper or whatever. People have SATCOM receivers already, right? But this is a cheaper one and a better one. Um, in the future, this, this new technology, I hope, will inspire young people, the next generation of engineers, to do things which were um, impossible before and surprising. So the laser supermarket checkouts, way down. You do surgery with these things. You weld cars. It's the basis of the internet. The internet wasn't even thought of where they then to the laser. So watch this space. So my question is also relevant to lasers. Do you think that we could potentially use uh, super lenses to focus the power density of lasers for application diffusion technology? Do you think that the existing materials could handle this kind of power? Yes. Um, that's actually what I'm working on at the moment, to build uh, materials which take light and can concentrate it not to half a wavelength, but to a fraction of a nanometer. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, well, I indicated that it's very difficult to make light talk to light, because photons ignore one another traditionally. And you have to bring them to very, very high concentrations uh, before they will see one another. And that's normally done by using very high-powered lasers. But it's not the power that matters, it's the concentration of power. So if you could take a modest power, and instead of focusing it to uh, 500 um, nanometers, you focus it to 0.5 nanometer, you, you get a factor of a million there in the density of the photons. And so for modest power, you could get a very, very high concentration, and you could switch light with light. That's one of the things. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do, we have a grant from the Moore Foundation to try and use these ideas of uh, focusing light very finely to image biological sa samples. It's a huge challenge, but we think we can find clever ways of, of using these very fine points of light to illuminate biological samples and hence uh, extract information, which, which was either very difficult or impossible to obtain before. So, so yes, we are working on these concepts of uh, um, a super focusing of, of light. Um, it's, it's a field called plasmonics, uh, which uh, it's a field that um, <clears throat> has existed for a long time, but we've only just realized in the last few years that it's potential for doing this focusing job. Archie Howey is somewhere in the audience, and he's worked on plasmonics for a long time. 
but he's looking at his iPhone now, so he hasn't heard me. <laughs> Um, are there a analogs of metamaterials in geophysics or, or even acoustics? Um, absolutely, yes. Um, so a, a friend of mine in Hong Kong, a visiting professor in Hong Kong called Ping Sheng, he is working on um, artificial materials for con controlling sound. So one thing you can do is... Um, One thing you would like to do is to insulate the walls of an apartment, okay? Um, and you can do this very, very well for high, high notes. And so if your neighbor is a violinist, that's fine. You can blot him out by putting some stuffing inside the wall. But if he uh, plays the double bass, that's uh, uh, much more difficult. If he plays the drums, it's impossible. Uh, and the reason is that the lower the frequency, the harder it is to build a wall that will keep the sound out. And the wall um, uh, has to be more massive the lower the frequency you keep out. And in Hong Kong, where the apartments are already quite small, you can't have very thick walls, uh, quite apart from the expense. But the sound actually, um, because it technical again, obeys a second order differential equation. There are actually two boundaries which will stop sound getting through. One is uh, an infinitely massive wall, because it won't move if the sound hits it, so nothing gets through. That's difficult and expensive. Um, the other solution is an infinitely light wall, because that can't transmit the pressure through. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, infinitely light walls don't exist. Um, but you can fake them with metamaterials. So you can, uh, you saw how this electromagnetic metamaterial consisted of a series of little resonators which rang at a certain frequency and had properties one side different from another. You can build resonators for acoustics as well. So what he has is, is a, a wall consists of little cells the metamaterial, and this cell has a membrane of plastic, and in the middle is a little weight. And so that thing resonates at a certain frequency. And when they all resonate together in the right sort of way, you can actually stop very low frequency sounds from going through that wall. So yes, acoustics is, people have built cloaks for acoustics. Um, people have uh, tried to build cloaks for earthquakes. One of my <laughs> former postdocs, uh, uh, a very imaginative uh, French guy, Sebastian Queno, he has decided, works in Marseille now and designed a cloak for earthquakes. And he actually, it, it consists of very, very simple. You, you, um, you make a metamaterial out of the ground surrounding the object you want to cloak by drilling holes in it. And he actually persuaded an oil company to, to do this, drill a series of holes. And then, uh, do you know these thumper trucks? that they use for oil exploration. They just, a truck with a huge weight on it and they drop the weight on the ground and then it makes a little earthquake and you measure the vibrations. And uh, they did this earthquake experiment uh, on his metamaterial structure and indeed he showed that you could deflect earthquake type wa waves. Of course, building a big cloak around a Manhattan skyscraper is not feasible, but if, if you had a, a nuclear power plant, you might want to think about setting aside some land around it, so maybe it's not as crazy as it sounds. Professor Pendry, thank you so much for a truly memorable lecture. Much.